Hi guys, Andrea Mills here today. Um, I have been getting quite a few questions from several people about home church. So I thought I'd make a video today about, well, just answering lots of those questions and um, it has potential to be very long. So I'm going to go ahead right here and put a little um, table of contents here with the times or everything that I'm going to talk about and the times that they come in the video so if you want to jump to something in particular you can do that or at least it gives you an idea of where we're going and maybe we'll help you uh, stick with it to the end because I'm sure that this is going to turn out kind of long. So the first question is um, why do we home church? So I guess I'll start with um, I guess our story that we, Tom and I grew up in different places. I grew up here in the town we live in. He grew up in um, California and we both grew up in Southern Baptist um, churches. And when he moved here, where I am, where we live now, his stepdad became the pastor of a church here that is the same church where that had the Christian school that I went to school at. So I had graduated from that school, but I didn't actually go to church there. But um, the church was going through some transitions at that time, and so they had asked me to come and run the school, and then my husband's, uh, Tom's stepdad, became the pastor. So that's how we met, was at the church there. And um, we went to church there for, well, let's see, I would say about five years or so, six, let's see, this is our 17th anniversary this year. We've had a home church for 11 years, so I guess six years. So we were there for six years. So um, we were running the school and, you know, having church and doing all that. And then um, eventually we started to have some pretty strong disagreements with the like some of the doctrines in the church and at that time Tom's dad was no longer the pastor he had left and so um, anyways we just had some pretty major disagreements over things and we hadn't made a big deal out of it but for about two years we were pretty uncomfortable with how things were going and by then we had had two kids and I was pregnant with our third child and so we had um, we finally made the decision to leave the church, which was a very difficult thing for us to do. Um, my aunt and uncle are actually the ones who had originally started the church and were still, you know, kind of running things. And they were very, they are very special people to me. I had been very close with their family growing up. I practically lived at their house. Um, actually, I did live at their house when, <laughs> right before Tom and I got married. So. Anyways, they were very important people to me. My parents went to church there. My um, brothers and sisters went there. My cousins went there. It was very much a family. Um, it was very much my family. We were a family there. And also with the fact that we ran the school, um, Tom and I were there for six out of seven days a week. So this was a huge part of our life and it was a really, really big decision to leave. Um, so we did we finally we ended up leaving in april of 2005 and for a couple of months we went and visited other churches and we just never felt like anything fit i guess i guess one of the things that we just felt like was everything just felt so superficial and I don't mean to be judgmental or anything it's just that's how we felt about it that we, we went into places where we were new and even though we'd been in church our whole lives everything just felt like like it was a show that was being put on and I don't know I can't really explain it. it's just that nothing felt right at all so we decided just to um, stay home and at the time we're thinking you know if God leads us somewhere that's what we'll do but in this interim period, we'll just stay home and have church at home. So my parents had come with us and uh, I think, yeah, my, my brother and his wife and my sister too. So several people had ended up leaving at the same time that we did. So we kind of had a group that we started with 
over time they all well my mom died so they don't come anymore my my dad kind of quit going to church at all when my mom died and um, my sister and her husband ended up going to, to a church that was the one place that we had discussed if we were gonna go somewhere that was um, the one that we were most liking but it's just the distance we didn't really want to commit to going somewhere that we had to drive all the time anyway so it has been 11 years now that we've been at home and I don't think we have any desire anymore to look for a church we really have seen a lot of good fruit come from having a home church and um, at this point obviously we have no idea what the future holds but at this point we are not looking at all to change what we're doing I think one of the biggest benefits to being at home is that it's kind of like with homeschooling I guess that there just seems to be something inherently good with this kind of this close group that we have um, right now we have one other um, family that comes regularly and um, well by that I mean every week they're always here with us but over time just the relationship that we built with the people who come and the um, relationship with God that we built in the sense that when I guess when you go to church and you're sitting in a pew and you're just receiving this message all the time it becomes very blase like you're not putting your own thinking into it it's kind of like getting baby food I guess that they're just telling you things and hopefully it's good I mean because a lot of times it's not so let us hope that you're getting a good message but at any rate you're just kind of swallowing and consuming and when we're at home we aren't there's no one in front that's the expert that we're all listening to we're all thinking and talking and interacting with each other and there's just there's just been tremendous growth in us and in our kids and our friends have said the same thing that um, our friends that come are about 15 years older than us and they have said you know all the years that they spent in church was it's just such a different experience they've been coming to our house for I think seven or eight years now and they're like you know it just it's like their whole life is different it was completely different once they started a home church from what it was before and I, I'm, I, I'm not trying to be offensive or anything like that so that, that's not my point in sharing this is I'm not condemning conventional church or anything like that I'm just I'm hoping to encourage people who are thinking of home church that it's it is a good thing good things happen when you stay home so that leads me to the next question was as kind of along the lines of is it wrong to home church like is it sinful or is it going against God's will um, I guess just kind of those things when whatever you're stepping outside of the cultural norm we have to take pause and think is this a good thing or a bad thing because there's a reason that everybody does it that way so if we make a different choice that is something that we want to think about like why why am I doing this is this okay kind of a thing so I want to talk about um, what church actually is um, <clears throat> this was something I thought was very interesting we've been trying to learn Greek and when we realized in the um, New Testament when we have when we see the word church in the Bible the the Greek word actually just means assembly so it's the assembly you know literally the people that are gathered together and it's the same word it means the same thing as it was in the Old Testament when it talked about Israel they were the assembly so when Moses came and stood in front of everyone he was in front of the assembly and here's the thing about the Old Testament the things that happened in the Old Testament is that they were metaphorical in the sense that <laughs> I'm gonna be rambling here for a second but everything the only way we can understand abstract spiritual ideas is through metaphorical physical things so um, I'm trying to think of a right offhand for instance if you say 
let's say that we know we know what it feels like to be comforted by our mother and to have her put her arms around us and to hug us and we feel physical warmth when we're being cuddled by that person who loves us we feel feelings when that happens and we can meet a new person that we have never had any sort of physical contact with but as we talk to them and we get to know their personality if they seem like a very nice welcoming person we will say that they are a warm person and if they feel really standoffish and um, not personable we would say that they are a cold person and so this this abstract spiritual idea is this um, person's personality it's not something you can see you can see the actions of it but you can't actually see a personality but we can describe it in physical terms in metaphorical terms in that warm or cool idea and um, the book of Hebrews has a wonderful job of explaining at least some of the metaphor of the Old Testament the Old Covenant things that were happening but God uses, I think he uses everything in the physical world to help us to understand the abstract spiritual ideas so that we can, it's a metaphor that we're living to understand the things that we cannot see yet with our eyes. And it's the same with the, the church, the, the assembly. The Israel was there. God produced it on purpose to teach us metaphorically give us a metaphor to understand the spiritual idea so when Israel was physically gathered in the land and they were listening to Moses speaking that then teaches us the spiritual idea of when the new covenant came you know Jesus came the mystery was that it wasn't just for one group of people it was for all mankind that um, <clears throat> there's only one God so he has to be the God of everyone. He takes, um, his assembly comes not just from this physical heritage. It, his assembly is actually comes from every tongue and tribe and nation. He gathers us together in one new man. We're all part of the body of Christ. And again, that whole idea is metaphorical because we aren't physically, literally a finger. But as Paul explains, in the abstract spiritual sense that we all are we all work together we're all part of that assembly so then we come to what happened when Jesus died and um, rose again and goes back into heaven there was this whole New Testament period was a very confusing time for people because Jesus said the the old the law would not go away until heaven and earth passed away and that is metaphorical for that whole old covenant system the all of that stuff had to be finished and done away with before the new covenant system was fully put into place and that's kind of what the writer of Hebrews is explaining it you know that what was what was was obsolete and was soon passing away but they were still ha it was still in place and so Paul you know is addressing this with so many people like the Jews were under the law and so they were circumcised physically even though physical circumcision was just a metaphor to help us understand circumcision of the heart but they were trying to decide you know when these other people come from other places for the Greeks and the Romans and the people from Asia when they became Christians do they need to be circumcised or not and um, obviously they settled it out that no they didn't because physical circumcision wasn't really it didn't really do anything or mean anything other than to teach us about a spiritual idea so there was no point in bringing putting that physical um, sanction or whatever you want to call it onto these people who'd never been under the law so what's happening then is they are waiting for the old covenant to fully be set aside which is what happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed the sacrificial system was destroyed it was all done away with and so at that point on there's only new covenant old covenant stuff was completed that um, picture that metaphorical physical world was done with so that the true the true church the true assembly was fully established and 
so that's where we are now. So in that that period, if you look, I guess, <laughs> during that period, we can see how people operated as far as church went, as, as far as assembly went. Um, I wrote a list here of specific people that are mentioned in the New Testament as having churches meeting in their houses and Priscilla and Aquila or Aquila however you want to say that they had one in their house Philemon had one in his house Nympha had one in her house we also have several examples in the book of Acts of um, Paul or Peter assembling together with different people and talking teaching them at that point and so obviously throughout the New Testament period, the example we're given is not what we have now. Not, well, not the conventional churches that we have now, where there was a building um, set aside, where there was a pastor in the front, and you know pews all facing forward, and we go through this routine or whatever. And I'm, I'm again, not saying that there's anything wrong with it. That's just not the example that we're given. What example we do have is that believers assembled together with those people who were close to them in their homes and they met together to eat together to encourage each other to pray together to learn together to um, sing together to worship together and that was happening not in the context of a large group of people with the expert in the front it was happening in the t context of families meeting together in their homes and I guess then I want to say that to me there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a home church because that is the example that we're given of how it's done. It's never been about that um, pomp and circumstance, that show or that ritual. Those rituals always were to help us to understand a spiritual idea and the spiritual idea is that all men can be one in Christ and that we minister to each other's needs, we love each other, we care about each other, we develop relationships with each other, we serve God by serving other people. And when you are in a church it becomes very easy to start focusing on the wrong things, that it becomes about building a building, a nice building, and about um, having all these programs and having, you know, special funds for this and that. And all the while people can be sitting there not actually connecting with anyone because we're all facing one direction. And even if you can get somebody to come again for some of these smaller group things, why not just do away with that whole expensive system and just stay home? and build those relationships face to face with each other in the way that the example is that we have from the New Testament. So is it wrong then to have a home church if it's only your family? I would say no because wherever two or three got to gathered together God is in their midst that an assembly doesn't have, well, doesn't have a specific number. You're assembled. If there's more than two people you're assembled together. Obviously it is nice. I think God made us to be social people and to have community and so if we can get other people to come with us then that is wonderful but there's nothing wrong with it just being the two or three or however in our house it would be ten that would be gathered together with just your family and I think there might be seasons if you do have a home church where it might just be your family for a while and I think that's a perfectly okay thing. This isn't, it's, it's kind of, it reminds me of the what about socialization thing like when you homeschool and everybody freaks out thinking that your kids are going to be unsocialized and it, it kind of feels that way with um, church that if you don't do the conventional way that you are not going to have fellowship with other people and that's very far from the truth. Um, I think it, it it all comes down to cultivating an attitude of hospitality in ourselves and purposely inviting people to come in, not just on Sunday morning, but any time of the week that, you know, you make your house an open home so that people will come there and you're you're purposely seeking them out so that they 
can become part of your life and maybe they'll come then and want to actually have a Bible study with you on Sunday morning but if they don't assembly happens every day of the week there is no day that assembly needs to be we we have it is it's good I think to have a, a routine day set aside but that's not the the end of everything it doesn't have to be in that um, conventional way I guess here's our next question do people do people think we're weird or unchristian because we home church? I have no idea if people think we're weird or unchristian, but I don't I don't think that they do. Um, we meet a lot of people because of Tom's business, so he actually knows a lot of the pastors around the area because he's the computer guy. So he ends up spending a lot of time in um, their homes or in their churches and we've actually become good friends with lots of them. One of the interesting things, I'm not saying this would happen necessarily for anything else, but one of the interesting things that we've had happen to us is because we don't go to church, we have be able, been able to develop friendships with many pastors in a way that they can't with people that are part of their congregations because I guess there's the, kind of that professionalism that has to kind of be there when it's a member of your church and since we don't go to church anywhere no one feels threatened by us so we're pretty much welcomed everywhere we go and we do go to Bible school at some of the churches and if there's some special thing going on we like to go and get see people you know but um, I don't remember ever anyone treating us like there was something odd about us because of it and being a Christian that's just um, you can't know us for very long without knowing that we're Christian and we I mean it's such a part of our life that we talk about God all the time so I don't think anyone would ever think that we were unchristian because well it's pretty obvious that we are Christian just from talking to us so then there's the worry of what if because our kids are growing up in this sort of a home church setting that they don't really know how to do church or they might not want to go to church when they grow up um, as far as how we do things at home, we do have the kids sit down with us when we're having church and we're not harsh about it, you know, they're little kids and we'll let them play with their blocks or whatever quietly while we do church. But it's still part of that routine that we have for our family that Sunday mornings from at 10 o'clock we all sit down and this is what we do together. And when we have to go to another church for something, we've never had a problem with the kids being naughty. They just sit just like they do at home. and. Um, they are they do good we it, it really has not been an issue for us at all taking them places as far as when they grow up we obviously don't have anybody that has gotten old enough to leave home yet so I don't know what the future holds but um, here's my thoughts on the issue that I have witnessed this with other people that I care about that I feel like when um, when church is just the ritual that you do that your parents make you do that I call them comfortable heathens that it produces comfortable heathens who are sitting there every Sunday morning and they're mentally marking off their list that they did their duty and they went to church and then it's gone from their brains the rest of the week and I don't know that home church is necessarily going to produce something different other than it's so much a part of our life learning about God talking about God, talking about life with our kids. It's not just something that happens for that couple hours on Sunday morning. It's just part of our life all the time and it's hard for me to fathom my kids rejecting that when they get older but of course I have no idea. I'm, I have no control over that and I have no, um, I can't see into the future so I really don't know what's going to happen. The risk is going to be there no matter, no matter what sort of Sunday morning activities they, they have. What does happen that I feel like is a good thing is that on Sunday mornings the kids are part of what's happening and they're participating actively in what's happening and it's their own faith I hope that we're building. I mean we're constantly working or talking with them about about their own hearts and what's going on in there and I, I feel like it will be harder for them to reject that when they get older because it's not just 
us, I'm hoping, it's not just us putting something on them, but I'm hoping it's growing something in them. And I don't even know exactly how to explain that. But, um, but I guess, yes, we don't know. None of us know what, what the future holds one way or the other, wherever our kids are sitting on Sunday mornings. So how do we do it? Um, this is our routine that we do and it's not exciting at all, but this is just how we do it. So on Sunday mornings, we officially start at 10 o'clock, but usually when everybody gets here, we visit and stuff for a little while. So it's usually more like 1030 when we actually get started. So then we, um, we sing a few songs and we have like some karaoke kind of songs that we play on the TV. So there's words that come up. And then recently we've been getting some from YouTube that have, we can watch them on there that have the words, you know, pretty pictures and all that. If we were musically inclined, we might play music, but we aren't. So we just do it that way. So we usually sing a few songs together and then, um, we have our audio Bible, which I've talked about this before on other videos. The reason we got our audio Bible was actually to use it for church purposes. When we were still going to a church, we were going to use it there for Bible study. And then that, now that's what we use at home and we listen to it. It's going 24 hours a day now. That's not how we originally were using it. But um, I will mention before I keep going that our audio Bible is it comes from faith comes by hearing is the name of the company or the website that we got it from um, it has different voice actors that do all the different parts and it's got sound effects and it's a very it's a nice and interesting to listen to so after we sing then we usually will listen to up to three chapters on a Sunday morning from the audio Bible just depending on how they, long they are and when we get done with a chapter, everybody kind of follows along in their Bibles. And when we get done with a chapter, then we just discuss whatever came up that day. And we do it in chronological order the best that we can. So we kind of are jumping around. But um, anyway, so we have discussion time and the kids are free to participate in the discussion. And Tom usually, you know, is kind of the leader. But everyone participates in talking about or asking questions about what we read and um, it just is it's just nice it's just a nice Bible study a lot of times not you know not as much as what we listen to the audio Bible but a lot of times we will watch debates that we either buy or we get off of YouTube and we like to listen to debates on different topics because I think you know, a lot of times we believe what we believe by default because that's what we were taught growing up. And I think it's really good to listen to other perspectives. So we really enjoy listening to debates on different topics and we will, <laughs> it takes us a long time to get through them sometimes because we have to keep stopping and talking about whatever somebody said. And you know, we are just thinking about it and looking things up and it's a very interactive experience when we watch debates here for church. After we get done, you know, we pray and all that. We always have lunch together. So I have a routine of lunches that we plan and then whoever's coming brings something to add to the lunch. So it's kind of like potluck and then we eat together and then we usually spend just time visiting and kids play and just spend time together. So, um, that's how we do it. Obviously, there's not the only way to do it, but that's just how we do it. The relationships that we have built with our friends over this time has been uh, very fulfilling, I guess, because <clears throat> each week it's just nothing. You know, it's just nothing in particular. It might even be a bad week for whatever reason, but just that consistently spending time with fellow members of the assembly and that face to face interaction, talking about God together, talking about our lives together. We have built a very deep and la lasting friendship with them that I don't remember having with anyone when we actually went to church. Even though we saw people every week, it was very, it was just much more superficial because we really weren't spending that same time just looking each other in the eye and being um being friends with them so what if 
you don't have anyone to have church with or to assemble with on Sunday mornings, um, I first want to say that you're actually not alone. And the, the real deal, the real idea of it is just as the, the Old Covenant physical, metaphorical Israel, the metaphorical assembly, they 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 physically assembled together on one piece of land. The new covenant way is spiritual assembly that we are all if we are in Christ, if we believe in Christ, we are part of the assembly no matter where you are in a physical sense that your your body is here but spiritually you're already part of an assembly. There's not um there aren't individual churches in the sense that each church is its own assembly. Everyone is one in Christ. Everyone is part of the assembly. Um, that is not to say, though, that we shouldn't gather together in a physical way. Um, in, the, in the New Testament, Paul admonishes some of the people who realize, you know, that the Sabbath keeping was a... Um, a metaphor of the spiritual reality of the rest and the inheritance that we receive eternally in heaven. Um, Hebrews explains all of that part of it too, but when the Old Covenant passed away, or as it, it was passing away in the New Testament period, a lot of the people, since they didn't have to keep the Sabbath anymore, were just going on with daily life and not ever gathering together with each other. And so Paul's telling them, you know, don't do that. Don't go so far as that you don't even get together at all anymore. Just because you don't have to keep the Sabbath doesn't mean that we don't want to be with other like-minded people. We want to. That's It's part of our nature to want to connect with and be a part of other, you know, a group of believers. That, um, that being said though it doesn't happen just like we don't longer have to assemble physically on one day of the week we still want to assemble all the time so we should um, be looking for ways to be hospitable to open our homes to gather together with other people and just have that spirit of hospitality of connecting with others something that Tom and I did for about a year which is partly how it came to be that our friends um, have been with us for so long now is that we just determined that every Friday night we were going to have someone over so during the week if we met someone or we thought of someone that we hadn't seen for a while we would invite them to come over and have dinner with us on Friday and we were tried very hard not to have the attitude of trying to impress someone so we try to keep the food very simple and um, we might play games or just visit or whatever but we just wanted to make a regular habit of being hospitable and inviting people into our life and forming connections with them. That's how our friends came to us now. We met them at Bible school and then met them again at well, the library. And then that's when I invited them to come over and have dinner with us on a Friday night. And um, then we just kind of started seeing each other and eventually they started coming over on Sunday mornings for a Bible study with us. So, um, there are ways to connect with people outside of a church setting, which, like I said, like pretty much everybody I know I met at the library, but of course there's, you know, the homeschool co-ops and there's just, there's still, you can still go to church events and do things, even if that's not where you are on a regular basis, but always just be thinking in terms of the bigger assembly that that you're part of a bigger thing and connecting with people doesn't happen one day a week it happens anytime and bringing people in ministering to them connecting with them is what it really means to be part of that assembly so I wouldn't worry about whether or not there are people sitting on your couch on Sunday morning I would be more concerned about whether or not you're reaching out and connecting all the time and that also means that we never have tried to grow a church. We have not tried to force someone to be here in the sense that we don't guilt trip people or whatever. That we feel like God brings people into our lives that he wants us to be ministering to or be ministered by. 
when he wants them here. So if somebody comes along, we meet somebody, we connect with them, and they start coming, then we're so happy for that. And if they decide to move on for whatever reason, there's no hard feelings. It's just the way it is that God brings people in and he takes them back out of our life. And we aren't, um, we're not putting up signs or something or trying to start something. We don't have in our minds that we're building like a conventional church. We're not trying to grow in numbers. What we're trying to do is spiritual growth. We want to see that that we ourselves and the people that we're connecting with are becoming more Christ-like no matter how many people that is. And so the last question that I had was, do I feel churched on Sunday? Like, do I feel like I've actually been to church? And I'm not really sure how to answer that because it obviously doesn't feel like going to a regular church where I'm sitting in a pew and doing all that. But at the same time, it's such a part of our routine that it's it definitely feels like we have done something meaningful, important, even though, like I said, it might from week to week, it doesn't necessarily feel like anything spectacular is happening. But over the years, I can look back and I just see that fellowship that's happened and that connection that's happened and that spiritual growth that's happened that I can't say, I don't know what would have happened if we had stayed in a regular church, but I, I feel like being home has been very instrumental in um, us connecting in a real way with other people. I think it's easy to have, kind of like being on Facebook where you can have like a thousand friends but you don't really know them or care about them. That's kind of how it can be when you're in a church, especially a bigger church, that they, you might recognize their faces, you might say hi or whatever, but you're not really connecting with people. But on the other hand, you can have one other person sitting there and you're looking at them in the eye and you know what's going on in their life and you can encourage them and they're encouraging you and and that's what it means to be part of the assembly in in that in that sense obviously there's more to being part of the assembly than just that but when it comes to um that connection and that uh personal i don't know personal relationships and all that i just feel like it's being home and being hospitable is an extremely valuable Thing that I hope if anyone out there has an inclination toward that that you would definitely not feel at all bad about giving it a try. So I want to keep on talking about home church and um, answering questions if anybody else has more questions about this. So if you want to keep having this conversation and you're not a subscriber I hope that you will subscribe and if you already are a subscriber I appreciate you taking the time to listen and to um, have this conversation with me today and we will see you again very, very soon.